Okay, we're still having people load in, but we're going to go ahead and get started because I want to make sure that we're staying on track as we try and always do for the Harris County Democratic Lawyer Association webinar. Uh, I'll give you two heads up. One is that we're cautiously optimistic that we'll be back live in April, but no promises. Uh, also, I can give you a high degree of probability we've booked for June for the uh, annual meeting uh, at the Hotel Zaza. As great as it was last year, we're hoping with the planning committee that will be even more outstanding with, with speakers that you'll want to be there with and a chance to have fellowship with your fellow uh, Harris County Democratic lawyers in June at Hotel Zaza. Well, as spring appears to be in the air uh, and we just finished an interesting primary, uh, we have our county attorney, Christian Menifee, who's already warned us because of his six month old, his voice is not where it always is with that big, bold county attorney voice. Uh, it's not quite so solid today, but he's going to share with us on two issues. One is more or less a recap on how things went in the voting process from his perspective as the county attorney, having been down this road before, uh, particularly in, in light of the different changes in the voting system, the voting processes that were imposed by our legislature. And then the other part is, is his statement and the statement joined by many other district attorneys and county attorneys in response to Governor Abbott's criminalization of transgender kids and their families. Uh, thank you, Christian, for joining us. Thanks for making it especially on such a busy day. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mike. And I, I'll start by saying that I love HCBLA because you're so bold and it's incredibly bold to have a political event the day after an election and to still be able to get solid attendance, I think is, is an extremely impressive thing. So thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm excited for you that you're going to get to hear from Jim Blackburn. Uh, Mr. Blackburn and I haven't had the opportunity to meet, but I've heard only great things about him from Charles Irvine and Ontario work and some of the folks who I know have run in, in his circles. Um, yesterday was an experience, uh, you know, in, in this election, this is our, I guess, first major election since SB1 went into effect. And it, the earliest issues that we saw was with the mail ballot process. As many of you know, under SB1, there are enhanced ID requirements um, for vote by mail applications. And so now you have to put either your social security or driver's license number on the vote by mail application. And that number has to match the same number that is in the registry from the Secretary of State's office back from when you originally registered. So if both numbers are in the registry, then fine, you can put either number. But if only one number is in the registry, then if you put the other number, then your application will be marked for rejection. And we saw that there were folks throughout Harris County and frankly, throughout the state of Texas who were having real issues with that. We had a, a, a much higher number of vote by mail application rejections than we've seen in previous cycles. Uh, and it's particularly disheartening because these tend to be the populations that are the most vulnerable, right? Um, our seniors, underserved communities, particularly communities of color, um, folks on active duty, uh, and, and Texans and Harris County residents with disability. So it, it was uh, a challenge to, to see that, and but we dealt with it as best we could. So we tried to very much engage in voter education. Um, the elections administrator and, and I as well we're out talking on various mediums to try to inform folks of the process uh, because the main challenge we saw was the Secretary of State's office did not have a robust education process in place, right, to, to inform voters of the changes that were going to be made, nor were they working hand in hand uh, with elections administrator offices across the state to ensure that that information was being disseminated, if not from the top, then in a decentralized fashion uh, from the various county offices. So it, it, it was a challenge. And of course, all of this was going on in the midst of our various legal fights against the state of Texas over uh, SB1. Uh, so we filed suit on behalf of the elections administrator against the state uh, to challenge a provision in SB1 that makes it a crime for public officials and elections officials to encourage folks to apply to vote by mail. Well, and the main challenge there is under the new law, candidates are able to encourage folks to apply to vote by mail. So, for example, you saw that in the last election, former President Trump and uh, Representative Crenshaw, various individuals sent out mailers encouraging folks to apply to vote by mail so that they could secure those votes. But under this new law, for some reason, it criminalizes that very same speech uh, by elections administrators or, or public officials. And this includes other elections officials, such as election workers, 
uh, precinct election judges and other folks who get involved in this process because they want to protect and promote democracy. And so we argued that this is a violation of their First Amendment rights because truthful speech can only be uh, restricted in certain circumstances. And, and we didn't believe that this was one of them. So we got a big win um, in the Western District of Texas in front of Judge Xavier Rodriguez. He issued a TRO uh, preventing enforcement of it. But of course, uh, the Fifth Circuit very quickly thereafter issued an administrative say. And so we are set for oral argument in that case um, soon. I believe in March, the, the initial briefing will be filed and then the arguments will happen. Um, and, you know, we're cautiously optimistic. We think that it's a pretty ridiculous law. Uh, but, you know, with the Fifth Circuit, you, you never know what can, what can happen. Uh, the second thing that we did was uh, send a letter to the DOJ to ask them to, to get involved. You know, they had already filed their own lawsuit uh, to undo SD1 or prevent enforcement of it. But we wanted them involved in the vote by mail process. And we've been having conversations with the Department of Justice. And we're going to try to determine what that will look like in future elections. So that was kind of piece one of the challenges we saw in this election. And piece two, of course, was uh, election day. Many of you know, but for years, we were criticized here in Harris County by members of the Republican Party for not having paper ballot backups uh, in our elections, right? And under the old voting machines, you would go in, there was a toggle, it was a screen, you would press some buttons, you would go out, and there would be no physical paper record of how you voted in the election. And so once you saw the big pushes to undermine the integrity of our elections and the confidence in our elections, there was a strong push by some uh, to ensure that there was a paper ballot backup in case any issues arose with the elections, you would have that physical evidence of how people voted and you can ensure that no election would be compromised. Uh, so we did that. We switched to machines that, that have paper backup, but of course that created all kinds of issues. Um, being that yesterday was the first primary election since those new election, uh, election machines went into place. And so there were challenges. Uh, we'll navigate it as best we can. We were kind of on call the entire night to help the EA's office through legal issues. Uh, but we anticipate that, you know, there are going to be continued issues there. And, and I think the goal is to get everything together so that by the time the November election comes, we know how to properly utilize those machines. But more importantly, the electorate is properly informed and the county is investing in that process. And the last thing I'll, I'll quickly discuss is the directive issued by Governor Abbott uh, against parents with, with trans children, which of course is based on legal opinion. So a couple of weeks ago, Attorney General Ken Paxton issued a legal opinion that under the family code, as it's currently written, um, if parents of transgender children allow those children to have uh, gender conforming health care, such as puberty suppressants, for example, even if those parents consult with a medical professional, right, and, and understand the process and get consent from their kids, it amounts to child abuse because, as the argument goes, uh, children cannot consent to sterilization. And that's what the AG's office argues uh, is uh, happens in many of these instances. And they go on to argue that every single American has the right uh, to procreate. And so by allowing these folks to do something that may uh, infringe on their right to procreate, you are committing child abuse. Uh, of course, it is a legally meritless uh, opinion, which twists and turns the law to meet political goals. Because if, if you recall, at the same time, the candidate for attorney general who has since lost Louis Gohmert was pushing that the state government should not allow families uh, to permit their kids to get gender affirming health care. So soon after that opinion was issued, Governor Abbott issued a directive to the state CPS department, the Department of Family Protective Services, ordering them to investigate parents with trans kids who allow their kids to get gender affirming health care based on this legal opinion. So I immediately, I guess within a couple of hours, put out a statement and, and did a tweet, uh, making clear to Governor Abbott that my office, which handles the civil prosecution of, of child abuse cases under the family code for the largest county in Texas, uh, was not going to allow my office to participate in, in these political shenanigans to the detriment of families with trans kids. Uh, so what we saw in that was, and I didn't expect it to be that big of a thing, I was simply telling the governor, hey, I'm not going to do that. And it kind of blew up, right? Uh, we made a bunch of national news and then soon thereafter, you saw uh, multiple district and county attorneys throughout the state of Texas uh, issue similar statements saying that they too were going to take a stand against the governor and not participate in that process. And it's based on a pretty simple legal theory, which is in these instances, I'm acting as a civil prosecutor. So I have prosecutorial discretion and the governor can't order us to do it if they if they want to take on those cases. 
and try to remove folks' kids from them for getting gender affirming health care, then the attorney general's office is going to do that. So right now, it remains to be seen uh, how far the state is going to take that. Uh, DFPS, as I understand, has started investigating some families, and at least uh, one set of parents and one doctor have uh, filed a lawsuit uh, against uh, the state of Texas over that directive, um, arguing that it violates certain rights. We're considering filing an amicus brief in that, but just know that the fight continues. And I just want to close with, you know, I, I've never been one to like put out statements where I don't think that there can be a meaningful impact. And after we put out that statement, I can't tell you the number of, of families, of parents, of advocacy groups that called into the office in tears, just grateful to know that Harris County was going to be with them, that Harris County was not going to come knocking on their door uh, and, and dragging them into court to try to take their kids. Um, so I think it's an important fight to have. I'm glad that we have folks across the state of Texas who are in elected legal positions uh, who are taking that stand as well. Uh, there's active litigation on it, and we'll see how it turns out. Uh, but I'm very grateful that you all allowed me to jump on today and, and provide an update. Again, my apologies about my voice, but it is very true that I have a six-month-old, and he doesn't much believe in sleep. Um, so I look forward uh, to continuing to chat with you all, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, Christian, two quick questions, if you don't mind, before we let you go. Sure. Ready? Uh, number yep. one, do you think it was purely a coincidence that Governor Abbott issued that proclamation the week before the primary? Absolutely not. Um, as you know, this is the same governor who, after former President Donald Trump, called for a 2020, uh, an audit of the 2020 election in Texas. Just a few hours later, he announced that the Secretary of State's office was going to audit four counties in the state of Texas. So this is somebody who clearly makes de decisions from the executive position based on politics. So it's no surprise to me at all. And it's definitely not a coincidence. So the second question, if they're going to tie child abuse to suppressing procreation, what's that going to do for abstinence-only education? Uh, and, and that's one of many arguments that just show uh, the idiocy that uh, is the basis of this legal opinion. Um, I think it's completely meritless. I think there's a reason why you haven't really seen the governor or the AG say much about it since they put out their initial statements. And I, and I think the answer is they, they clearly know that it's nonsense. But unfortunately, to these families who are running the risk of, of having their children taken, it's not nonsense. And so I think it's important for us to stand up and do the right thing here. Well, thank you for being on the forefront of both issues. Thank you for joining us today and, and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me and good luck, Jim. Talk to you all later. Thanks. So now, now we're going to hear from, from the main attraction today and the reason why uh, uh, I, I believe it's so appropriate today, uh, particularly is it really feels like the first day of spring. Part of it is I'm coming out of a quarantine, so it feels like spring anyway. But the other part of it is that, that what, what Jim talks about is what's important for lawyers, and that is to recognize where they fit within not just the legal world within our legal community, but kind of the greater world, the, the natural world, as well as self-care and the things that we as lawyers of all, of all types face, the challenges, the pressures. Uh, and what he's going to share with us now is kind of not just his journey, but kind of hopefully uh, open up a little bit about other areas that we as lawyers, we as Democrats should be looking at consistently. Uh, Y'all probably have heard of Jim. He's been an environmental activist, an environmental leader, an environmental lawyer, litigation leader for decades, for as long as I've been around in Houston. Uh, there's a lot of different things that he's been involved in and continues to do. But I think right now at this point, uh, I'll turn it over to him and let him share with you a little bit before we go to a QA, and a uh, what he's kind of on his path of life and legal path some of the lessons that may be worth sharing with all of us at this point. Thank you for joining us, Jim. You bet, Mike. I'm happy to be here. And uh, what I want to do today, if everybody can see my screen, uh, Mike, can you see the screen okay? We are all good. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, it, it is, uh, I'm, I was surprised to be asked and uh, to speak at a uh, continuing legal education uh, uh, session about this book that I've written along with Isabel Scurry Chapman, who's the wonderful artist that has illustrated this book and it and has really uh, offered really a lot of thoughts through paintings, which is kind of an interesting concept in itself. The book is called Earth Church, and it has been is self published. Um, and these are the chapters of Earth Church, and uh, it really comes out of the COVID uh, situation. We, uh, Isabel. 
but would post a painting uh, every day and I would post a poem and a narrative to go with it. And we did this for a year solid and we called it the virus vigil. And coming out of that was this book, um, which is a collection of poems and thoughts about really earth-based spirituality and kind of how little that we understand the earth and how important it both is and should be to all of us, which I think fits into the care side of, of, of this story. Uh, I'm going to be taking excerpts from four of the chapters. Um, those are indicated in red here. And I want to start off with just talking a little bit about being an environmental lawyer and, and really perspective on kind of who and what environmental law is and who environmental lawyers are. Isabel made this image, and uh, it's a wonderful image, I think, that about Band-Aids on a screen that overlays the environment. If you think of that screen as our economy, uh, the Band-Aids are the environmental laws that we passed. And uh, this is kind of a, a, a kind of a beginning reflection on who an environmental lawyer is and kind of what we're about. The Band-Aid is a wonderful device, a good investment, a reasonable price. Band-Aids are great emergency measures, but not the way to protect your treasures. An environmental lawyer is like a Band-Aid brought in to prevent a resources raid. Go into court, file for an injunction, yet others continue without compunction. Band-Aids are nice, but they're not a cure. We need a new economics brochure, one that values the gifts nature brings, like wetlands and forests in hill country springs. Now, that is, I think, a statement of probably what, I, I don't think I realized that the environmental laws were really Band-Aids on an economy early in my career, but I certainly ran into the situation where we went from really stopping one thing only to see a dozen other things spring up, which is a problem I'm sure that all of you can, can equate. Now, there's a chapter in the book called Earth Church Solutions, and I put this in this sequence simply to say much of what I have come to work on are solutions to that economic system. And I think we will see a new economic system emerging in the future that is about a different way of thinking about economy relative to nature. And the closer we get economy and nature in synchrony, uh, the better we are. And just some of these topics, uh, like the earth having circular systems, uh, a circular economy, uh, climate change and hurricanes and what they mean for Houston and flooding, uh, the yard and kind of how it reflects so much of the old way of thinking and perhaps not the new way of thinking. Wetland protection, carbon capture by nature, smart floodplains, city of the future. These are all where we're headed. And I'm happy to say I'm working today on a lot of these things. But there is a point in, early in my career, in the early to mid 1980s, when I was drinking way too much. I mean, from a personal care standpoint, I was a wreck physically, mentally everything was was down. And so I went into a rehab center and luckily uh, was able to shake uh, alcohol, although it is an experience that has shaped who and what I am. And I, I wanted to offer this kind of personal insight as to kind of where I was and really kind of where, what my state was when I was not taking care of myself. The rehab center was a reality check. I came here right. I was a wreck. The doors were locked after I came in, a place to reflect upon where I'd been. But could this dog learn a new trick? I had lost my way. I was really sick. I began to claim, climb back out of the hole by realizing over alcohol I had no control. My self-image by now was not very strong. I knew that my thinking had been all wrong. But one event happened that made it clear that I was living with a load of fear. The event occurred in rehab art class, a breakthrough moment and into an impasse. I drew myself as a wounded bird, one wing hanging low, my vision bird, blurred. Now this image on the right was done by my artist um, partner, Isabel Scurry Trapman, but it's a very, very true rendition of exactly how I felt about myself at a point in my professional career. And I was, I was wounded, I was hurt. And I have figured out how to kind of take care of myself. And part of that is getting perspective on who and what I am and uh, kind of what's achievable, what is uh, imaginable, and then figuring out creative ways to go about it. The lawyer, that's me. 
I'm a recovering lawyer for the bird and the bunny. My self-image is unique and perhaps a bit funny. I'll stand up proudly for the birds of the world, looking for angles, searching for words. Now, lawyering has generally been good to me. I've had great clients to keep me company. I ask for help and believe in being humble. I learn to speak up clearly. I do not mumble. After court, I fly off to the church of the earth, rediscovering salvation, restoring self-worth. I am what I am, and I'm okay with it. Representing birds has been a good fit. So welcome to Earth Church. Pull yourself up a pew, and maybe a bird lawyer will be there for you. Now, I think what this reflects as much as anything is finding a way to take care of myself. After court, I fly off to the church of the earth. I mean, the church of the earth is the earth. It's, it's settings, it's scenes, it's outdoor places. It's, for me, linking with something more powerful than myself, nature, uh, life, and living systems. Uh, one of those places I love to go to uh, is Memorial Park and the new addition that they've got there called the Glades. Uh, Herman Park is wonderful as well. I uh, love to be along the bayous, but in this case, I've chosen Glades as an example. I've never been prouder of this place called Houston. Good has been done. Our image needs boosting. This space is a special one dedicated to ecology, a place to celebrate our Gulf Coast biology. Design can destroy a perfect earth temple, but here the touch is appropriate and gentle. A place is created where I'll, where I'll return to worship, ecology and humans together in partnership. So welcome to Earth Church. Pull yourself up a pew. Come to services at the Glades. There's a spot here for you. And the service is simply to go out in nature and to, an, to enjoy it and to appreciate it. And for me, that linkage with nature became a lifeline. And it became a way for me to kind of resuscitate the spirit within myself and to be able to go on and do some, uh, hopefully what I consider some pretty neat things. And I'll end this presentation with a poem about really the results of some of the, the neat things that come out of the type of work I do, which is uh, representing, if you will, birds like this little blue heron, and of course the people that live along Linville Bayou in Matagorda County. This one does not rhyme. Out of my car window, I see the little blue heron waiting in the clear stained water of Linville Bayou in Matagorda County, just off State Highway 521. My favorite road, by the way. It stands looking for fish in a bayou that was dead not long ago, killed by the discharge from a refinery, killed by toxic metals and polar organics concealed beneath a smelly foam that meandered with the water through the Columbia bottomlands, water where the frogs and crawfish and minnows could no longer exist. The little blue heron fishes today because of the actions of citizens living near the bayou. Citizens like K.J. Richardson, who loved to fish for flounder in the fall. Citizens who worked for the company and knew it could and should, should do better. Citizens who were willing to take a stand and go into court and complain that the oil giant was not doing right. The little blue heron fishes today because someone cared enough to take a stand for stewardship, for the ethical conduct of business, for corporate responsibility. The little blue heron never knew KJ, but they are inextricably linked in the wonderful way that ethical action in defense of the earth links all living things together forever. Now, I guess I'll start stop sharing here. I wanted to just give you a, a sense, a kind of a, a kind of a, a view, if you will, into some of my thinking and kind of what I was concerned about. Um, Back in the 80s, when I was getting sober, since then, trying to live in a reasonable harmony with, with myself, with others, and particularly with the natural system. And with that, Mike, I guess um, we'll go to the next part of the program. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, you have some great photos. Are those ones you've taken or just somebody else that uh, you've trusted to put on your wall? Oh, these behind me, they're by the uh, photographer, Jim Olive. Uh, he's uh, was, is a very close friend, and he and I wrote a book together called The Book of Texas Bays, which came out of A&M Press years ago. Uh, but these are photographs from that book. Well, and, and, and we, we have some questions coming in, but I want to again start with a couple that occurred to me uh, going through your book. One of them, and I, and I think we spoke about this a little bit before, uh, before we got started, uh, with the Harris... Uh, not Creek, but I guess the Harris Gully, which kind of I thought was very interesting, which was, as I understand it, a gully, a, a tributary of 
a braised bayou that, that basically snakes under Southampton rice area, the medical center. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and particularly how there's, I guess, a little remnant right there on the rice right. campus. Yeah, there's a wonderful part of Rice Campus, which is near Main Street. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the campus, it's near where the um, track stadium is. And what I think is important to note about it is we did, when we were developing Houston, when we developed the medical center, most of Harris Gully was covered up with concrete and was put underground. But there was one place where it came out on the Rice campus near the track uh, stadium, and that has become what we call the Rice Prairie. Uh, two, uh, two professors uh, many years ago uh, decided that this was an important area. They started an inventory of the uh, of the, certainly the vegetation there primarily. Paul Harkham uh, was a biologist. And it has become a, a kind of a little oasis in the middle of ur you know, urban development. And it's amazing the life that comes to that prairie. And you know, when I'm over, I teach at Rice, I, I teach uh, environmental law and sustainable design over in civil engineering. And a lot of times when I'm there late in the afternoon, I'll just, again, part of kind of my therapy, if you will, part of my meditation is to find little natural spots, even small pocket parks like this one, just to get out in and, and see what birds are moving around. There's always blue jays in there. There was a very unique prairie warbler that came through that kind of made the bird watchers all, all excited. But the point being is we've got these little bits of nature everywhere. Even if something as simple as a tree in your front yard, uh, if you think about tree in a COVID context, that tree was giving you oxygen the whole time COVID was coming after you. So, you know, in the isolation of COVID, I got to really reflecting a lot more on that tree and the value that tree has for us. And I, I think that's a lot of what I'm talking about, it's an appreciation of nature, of natural things, things we take for granted that to me helped me you know, really begin to take care of myself in a way that was very different than before. Well, and actually that, that's obviously one of the themes of your, of your book and kind of what you've shared with us is we all kind of take hits, particularly doing what we do, whether we're a, you know, an elected official, whether a, a lawyer you know, out there helping people as best we can and helping our community. But dealing with those hits, what is it that you kind of found about the profession, the path forward? And, and I think, I don't know if it's if it's your spirit animal, but you mentioned that that your higher power is a Metro bus. Is that your spirit animal or is that just kind of where you see it? <laughs> no, I'll start with I'll start with the higher power aspect. When you're getting sober, they encourage you to go to uh, AA meetings and higher power is an important part of that. And I was having a lot of trouble with that. I'd been raised a Southern Baptist and had kind of gone away from that and was trying to find myself and was really letting that get me all hung up. And there was a young man at one of the meetings and he stood up and he said, you know, I used to worry a lot about that higher power stuff, but he said, I just adopted a Metro bus as my higher power. It's bigger than I am and I can't control it. And, you know, it kind of just took the heaviness off of it. And, you know, that liberated me, frankly, to find Galveston Bay as my higher power, which ultimately translated in the Texas coast and the earth. But I think, I don't, I mean, most of us that are, went to law school uh, had some level of achievement. Uh, we, I would say most of us in one way or another were used to succeeding, uh, certainly in school, perhaps in sports and in, in various endeavors that we undertook. And all of a sudden you get out and no one tells you that you're just going to get your head knocked off sometimes, that you're going to be, you know, there, there is a bus coming at you and it's not a higher power, it's the other side. And, um, you know, you go into trial and, and you can you can get bruised pretty, pretty hard. Um, sometimes the judges aren't particularly kind about what you've submitted and you've got to learn to take those knocks. And I don't think anybody about well, most of the lawyers I've talked to have been poorly prepared to absorb those hits. And this is where what I found was that nature was my bomb. That the you know, nature for me. Whenever you know I was feeling bad, uh, particularly when I was you know being in the early years after being sober, when I wasn't turning to alcohol, which I I found didn't help me at all. Um, but a lot of us uh, have the same inclination to turn to alcohol to solve these problems. What I found is I could I could 
could get a lot of personal solace and satisfaction from sitting on the bank of Galveston Bay down in Seabrook and just watching the water and the birds and just kind of finding a peace and calm that comes from being tied into nature. And I could find that in the parks. I can find it now walking outside the front of my office and watching a couple of grackles um, up in a tree. Uh, so I have found something I think very special, which is a way to take care of myself. And it has, I mean, it's helped me through some awfully hard times. And uh, it has allowed me, I think, frankly, to take risks and chances. Um, uh, all of us have fear. And admitting to fear and dealing with fear is incredibly difficult. But I have been willing, I think, since I've kind of found this pathway, been much more willing to take on hard issues. And I've been much more willing to take risk and to really achieve some very, very uh, great places uh, that I don't know that I would have been, uh, frankly, able to do because I'm not so sure that the fear might not have held me back from that old person I used to be. And this is about taking care of yourself, in my opinion. Well, and, and that's, that's really actually kind of where I was going to ask you next. When you talk about, and it's really hard to do, the fear in dealing with the fear with self-help, and that makes you, gives you the opportunity to do even more and braver things, that's kind of hard for someone who's trained to be an advocate or at least trained in law school to kind of present positions to, to kind of digest. You got to give us a little more on that one, please. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's a lot about the, I mean, you know, I appreciate the fact that both sides have to have a position and things like that, but you know, there, uh, I have been, I don't know, uh, bruised, I guess, is one way to put it, by, by some of the ways in which people go about advocacy. Um, and I don't, I, I do think that I, I need to find a, uh, an ethical base for much of what I do. And I was losing that back in the 80s. I was losing sight of it. I was having trouble keeping my eye on what I felt was my personal ethics, my personal um, direction and compass. Let me, let me, so, you know, and I'm just going to take a guess. Back in the 80s, it probably wasn't the easiest thing in the world to be an environmental lawyer not representing a petrochemical company in Houston, Texas. Is that a fair guess? Oh, that's a real fair guess. It's not that easy today, but um, I've got a better attitude about it today and certainly learned a lot of things on the way. But I think it was, you know, part of that is kind of what, what, felt, um, what felt the worst to me was the almost the total unconcern about environment in the judiciary. Uh, I mean, it didn't get you elected as a judge to be concerned about the environment back in the early 80s. Uh, most of the political money is, is coming out of the corporate pockets rather than out of citizen pockets. And you know, those types of things. I mean, and those are the realities I think that many of us um, made. I mean, I'll never forget one time. Uh, one of the uh, state judges I was before, you know, kind of looked at me like, who are you? I've never seen you before and looked over to opposing counsel and said, well, I'm gonna go play golf with your, you know, with your uh, kind of lead partner this afternoon. I hope, you know, I'll tell him I saw you. And, you know, you begin to, to realize that, you know, there's a way the game gets played and it's not the way that necessarily is laid out in any of the textbooks. And, you know, the, you know, running into those realities of the profession, I think hurts a lot of us. And I think it's it, I think it's true in a lot of areas other than environment. I think the politics are pervasive in a lot of what we do, and I think um, you can have an excellent argument and just lose, um, and you know that hurts, and uh, particularly when you've done a good job, and frankly you probably should have won, you know by if you read the books and looked at it and you didn't, and you know that hurts, and uh, it's easy to fall into drinking as a solution for it, and. I found another pathway and it was to find nature and it was to let nature and basically let myself connect with nature. It's more than just going there. It's about actually enjoying it and taking it in and then beginning to realize what it's doing for us. And, you know, I think that one of the most amazing things is none of us would be here, but for the earth, but you know, 
we don't celebrate the earth. We don't, I mean, it's not part of our ethical construct as a general proposition. Uh, and that to me is one of the biggest travesties because we'll destroy the very thing that actually allows us to be if we're not careful. And right now we're doing a pretty good job of destroying it. And that is, a, you know, that's just kind of a reality. Well, when, when you talk about connecting with nature, it, I kind of hear, and I saw this kind of in the book, that you, weren't, you didn't really start off necessarily as an environmentalist before you became an environmental lawyer. Is that fair? Well, I was more of a hunter and a fisherman. I was always an outdoor person. Right. Um, and then I was in law school, and frankly, I didn't like law school much at all, but I was in law school when the first environmental laws were being passed. And so I, I saw a chance to combine some things, and then... I wrote, I wrote a paper and made the lowest grade in my class because, it, I mean, it's dumb me in law school. I didn't think politics played in law school. And, you know, I wrote a paper about the law of the oceans and making it into a nation so it could sue for pollution damage. And my professor was a former uh, Humble Oil Company international lawyer, and he thought it was the dumbest idea he'd ever heard in his life. And I won a national contest with that same paper. And that taught me a, a whole lot right there. Uh, but I went and what, got so a what did, you, what did it teach you, Jim? It, well, it taught me to I ought to at least look where my professor had worked before he came to work <laughs> at UT Law School. Um, you know, just I mean, it taught me that good ideas alone may not be enough. That there is more to it than that. And um, you know, those are those are that I don't think I really took that uh, lesson to heart like I did in the '80s. But in a way, it was the same lesson. It was a similar signal. It's just it hadn't hit me quite as hard um, in, the, in law school as it did, you know, when I was trying to practice early on. But how so? Know, I mean, what do, when you say, because that's one of the things about your practice that strikes me is so much of it has been arguing to, to judges only. I mean, I'm not saying you don't do jury trials, but that's environmental law in many respects is arguing statutes, arguing rules. It's more of a, I'm not going to say administrative, but it's more of a arguing to a judge, arguing to the appellate court than you would normally think of. How has that been for you, given all those other things you've shared with us? Well, I think, well, again, you know, you go to the state agency mm -hmm. and uh, they've got rules and they've got a rule book and uh, they've got uh, regulations. And I ended up getting a master's degree in environmental science and engineering after law school. So I actually got quite good at the science side of what we do. And I knew the science. And I frankly, you know, was, was really good at cross-examination of opposing uh, scientists. You know, and I, but I realized early on that the agencies kind of had a mandate to issue permits. And you had to go into the process realizing that you not only were opposing the opposing party, you were also opposing the state agency that was trying, that, that was supposedly was the taking of the, if you will, the middle ground position. They were supposed to be the decider or the arbiter of the decision. And one would have thought that would have been some, some aspect of fairness to that. And it's really not that way. I mean, you as, you as the practicality as an environmental lawyer coming in opposing a permit, you often are opposing both the state and the applicant. And you are generally expected to lose. I mean, the legislature looks to the uh, agencies to issue permits. And I mean, I've heard budget hearings where budgets have been threatened to be cut if they didn't take a more pro-applicant position on some of these states. And I mean, that's not news to anybody that practices environmental law, but it was news to a young environmental lawyer that was just beginning a practice. And, you know, the, knowing the science, knowing the impacts, knowing, if you will, what would happen if that permit was issued, and then they issued it, and they said they were protecting the environment in doing so, those were the things that sent me drinking. And uh, those were the things I had to find a way to work through. And, and you know, I, I, I described the way, and I'm pretty much retired from litigation these days, but in my litigating days, I'm, I was very much, uh, I thought of myself as a guerrilla lawyer, uh, in the sense you think of a guerrilla warrior. Um, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was take someone on head on, uh, for, you know, in state court, particularly. I mean, federal court for me was much better because I had, a, I think, a better chance of getting a fair judge in federal court than in state court in many cases. And at the agencies, it was trying to find ways to operate at the, come in from the edges on. 
uh, as opposed to taking everything directly head on. Because I, you get inundated with paperwork, and um, you know that will suffocate you as a private practitioner. Well, when you say guerrilla tactics, give, give us a little bit. And, and we had a question from from uh, uh, Lee or Orlando. One of the things, you know, what in terms of kind of guerrilla tactics that have been effective, what are you talking about? And, and I know you mentioned your book, you had a, a, a client who had a Bruja witch that kind of was a good predictor. Is she still out there in the market, by the way? Well, uh, that, that witch would be someone that every, everyone should call upon. It is a great uh, cycle. It made me smile just thinking that my client had consulted the witch before we went into uh, the proceeding. Um, and it know. worked. It worked. We won. Of course it worked. Um, but I think what I've found is that, you know, clients, uh, you know, and particularly on environmental issues, clients so often want a stake in the other side's heart. And so many times I, what I've learned later it sounds on like is, divorce law. Well, it's a lot like, you know, it, it is that way. Although oftentimes I can protect the client's interest with the settlement. And so over the years, I think I, on the one hand, would do something like issue, well, what I use federal environmental law much more than state. I mean, yeah, if there was a state permitting proceeding, I would try to find any way I could to get to federal court. And those usually involve notices of intent to sue, either on the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, RICRA, CERCLA, any number, Endangered Species Act. And those are wonderful devices to cause the other side to to rethink. Uh, the other side oftentimes doesn't negotiate when you're in state proceedings at administrative uh, agencies because they think they're going to win. But once you put a new court into the into play, and you don't have to file a lawsuit if you file a notice of intent, uh, but you certainly be you have to in order to be able to file a federal lawsuit under most of these federal environmental laws. What I found out is a, a lot of the a lot of the lawyers haven't. A lot of the lawyers I'm up against uh, respected somebody that was willing to try something different as opposed to just kind of playing things out. And, um, and, and that oftentimes could lead to settlements uh, that um, in some cases were acceptable. In other cases, you just have to go to the mat and work, you know, represent your client's interest and knowing that you might lose. Um, even with a decent settlement in front of you. So, you know, those are the things I've learned over the years. And But I'm always open, always keeping my eyes open for ways to settle disputes. I don't think they train us well enough about settling disputes. And, uh, of course, we've all got to work with our clients. But I think that, um, that there's a lot better, uh, and I'm not talking about just um, mediation and arbitration and things like that, but just to think in terms of, how to solve the problem. Um, you know, so I think if anything, I've become a problem solver later in my career, much more so, so than an advocate. Well, when you talk about, I mean, that means your fire's gone out or you're just looking at a different way. In other words, tell, tell me when you talk about I'm a problem solver, not what I started back in the 80s. Well, I mean, what do you mean? Like to, what happened? To the climate change, for example. Um, I mean, I'm very active in climate change. I mean, the fire, the fire has not gone out. I mean, there's no question about that. But the fire is different, if you will, it's stoking a bigger fire. Um, I'm now working with oil and gas companies that I used to sue uh, to uh, work with the agricultural community to find ways to pay farmers and ranchers for pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sticking it in the soil. And that's basically taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And some of the, some of the companies are trying as hard as they can to begin to reduce their carbon footprint, but they need to put some into the atmosphere. And I can come out, I'm now developing systems. I just developed a registry and we're issuing credits for uh, removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And those are being sold in transactions. And I've created a nonprofit entity called B Carbon and uh, we're doing this through a stakeholder process in the Baker Institute. But all of that came out of what I learned being an environmental lawyer. And I've been able to take this now to hopefully come up with a solution to one of the biggest problems the world has. So it was that same mindset. And I talk, I mean, I write about the, the prairie fairy in the Earth Church uh, book about the prairie fairy who follows the carbon dioxide through the the leaves of the prairie grasses and down into the roots and um, and into the soil and and that is a wonderful 
image for all of us. I mean, that basically puts the economy into a circular system that's much more in tune with the Earth's natural cycles. And so this is, uh, this is where, where I really have come to appreciate the fact that I found something beyond myself. And I think that may be the biggest lesson of all of this is so many of us, are, we have very big egos. And a lot of times getting beyond your ego is maybe the most important thing of all. I think that's where what I want. But gratitude is now one of the key concepts that I have. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm grateful for most everything I'm able to do these days and think of it that way. And it's fun. So carbon, right? That's that's something I hadn't seen about or didn't, maybe didn't follow the carbon market. Is that something that's set up with by the state? Is that something a federal? How does that work that you're... It's being having... developed totally outside of government. Uh, this is what, what I'm basically working with. If you think about that first diagram I started with about the patches on an economic system, uh, we had basically you know, the, the post-World War II economy was a faulty, is a faulty economic system. It is faulty because of those leakages that we had to have the band-aids. And what, what I'm working on today is building a different type of economy, one that is circular in nature. Uh, if you think of our old economy, it was you go out and you dig something up, you manufacture something, you use it and you throw it away. That's the linear economy. Everything in the future will be about reusing those resources and becoming more efficient, fewer carbon emissions, less water used. And this is the economy that's going to work with nature. And that's the that, and so what I'm working on now is enablement, and that happens outside of government. And so it, it's very interesting. I started off as a died in the wool regulatory environmental lawyer, and I'm now very much about enablement and market in certain circumstances and trying to differentiate when one is needed and when basically enablement is needed, which is very different. Yeah, but is that is that a function of, boy, that damn market doesn't get regulated very well, so I got to figure out another way, or this is really a better way to do it? If you, I'm trying, we're trying to take a billion tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And I don't think you can do that by regulation. I think you can't regulate our, our farmers and ranchers into changing practices. But if they see their next door neighbor making $100 an acre off of carbon transactions each year, and they're not getting any of that money, they're gonna try to figure out real quick how to get some of that money. So I trust money as a motivating factor if it's uh, basically uh, working, uh, you know, it, it'll take us, for this particular application, it'll take us in the right direction. So what, what are the farmers gonna do? Are they gonna plant like a replacement crop or prairie replenishment? What are they doing to get that, whatever that market is for the carbon on there? What are they doing? Well, we're, we're working with a group over in the United Kingdom right now that is, um, they're, they're growing barley and they're planting um, a cover crop and they're using no-till. So no plowing is essential because plowing will take carbon out of the, out of the ground. No-till, no-till agriculture, cover crop, they're going to get carbon credits and they're going to sell them to Heineken, which is going to try to market carbon neutral beer over in the United Kingdom. And so it's all about a changing consumer and changing. Yeah, most of these trends are coming out of Western Europe and are coming to the United States and they come out of the Paris Accords of uh, 2015, 2016 time period. And it's basically about everybody in the, in the world needing to have a net zero carbon emission by 2050. So it's, it's a very interesting process and probably the most stimulating thing I've ever worked on in my career. And so, no, there's plenty of fire there. It's just a different type of fire. You know, it's almost the difference between uh, back in that poem to start off with. I was talking about, you know, I could stop and protect a single wetland being filled but there was a dozen more that were happening that I wasn't hired to go after or that I couldn't stop. This is about designing a system that will stop it all. And so that's the evolution I've made is to try to come up with solutions that are big. So, and actually, I don't want to lose one question. Is your book an audible or recorded? Is there an audio of your book as well? Or you got to no, do it? No, no, it's just... It's just a hard print copy. And if I can say, I mean, you know, there are places you can buy it. So 
Is it okay to say? I mean, yeah, no, it actually, we posted it. I mean, obviously. Uh, okay, well, uh, Brazos, Brazos Bookstore has it. The Rothko Chapel Bookstore has it. It's on Amazon. Uh, Christ Church Cathedral downtown has a uh, bookshop. Yep, and we and, and uh, that's that's in the chat. That's why actually where we've been uh, following the the questions uh, on doing it. So, um, in terms of kind of, you know, you're not over yet. Hopefully, uh, what would you look at? I mean, you talk about what you're most excited is is turning carbon into beer, which is interesting given the the, the tone of your start being. But in terms of kind of the big stuff that you've done, looking back on it, what do you see as the most long lasting so far? So far. Uh, in the environmental arena? Well, I, I think the hooping crane litigation that I was involved in in federal court down in Judge uh, Janice Jack's courtroom uh, was probably the most memorable case I've ever had. And she it basically came out with a ruling that the state of Texas had killed 23 hooping cranes by their water management practices. Uh, hooping cranes eat blue crabs. Blue crabs need freshwater inflows. And the state of Texas had issued really too many permits on the Guadalupe River system and not enough water was coming in. And during a drought year, uh, a lot of cranes died because there were no blue crabs. And so it was a case about ecological balance. It was a case about an endangered species. And I've written a whole chapter in the book about endangered species, because I think that's a very, very interesting uh, area. So it's kind of like a death sentence case on, you know, in, some, in some ways in that the species could be lost if certain things are allowed to continue. And that's a little different than just losing a weapon. But what I would tell you about that, that experience is that um, it, I was before a judge that had read everything that we had submitted. That was absolutely quizzing every witness. And this was not a jury trial. It was a trial before Judge Jack. She wrote a 140-page decision that was fabulous. Of course, it got overturned by the Fifth Circuit. Um, I'll wait for the punchline, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, there, but the real punchline is after it was overturned and after we appealed to the Supreme Court to try to get um, them to hear it, and they didn't want to hear it, uh, we worked out a settlement with the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority, where they agreed to work with us. And essentially today they are developing a habitat conservation plan, which is what we had gone into court seeking. So we lost and achieved our goal. And that's a very important lesson. Sometimes it's standing up and fighting that's maybe more important than winning and losing on some of these battles that we that we all are involved in. Now, it's sometimes hard to tell a client that, but I think if you look at long-term effects, the, the fact that, that there was a, someone brave enough and, and willing, perhaps with no money, to stand up and do something really decent and fight for something and lose, that's worth something. And you know, that's kind of the, the you know, that's what I've learned to wear is you know, losing's not all bad. And by golly, I'll try as hard as anybody to win. But there's sometimes you're just not going to be able to win. But were you willing to take on a case you might not win? That's the key. Well, is that the poem if? I mean, it, and actually, that's a very Irish thing to say. You know, lost causes are almost always the best ones worth uh, fighting for. Is yeah. that really the big takeaway that you have at this point? No, not so much. I don't think they're all lost causes. I think that the willingness to fight is important. It's in the, I think the message is, these causes are not lost. That there, if you're creative as a litigator, you may find your way to a solution anyway, win or lose. That's the message. And uh, but that that's a little different than. And I mean, and I didn't have a firm. I didn't have a bunch of partners that were dependent upon me. I had some employees that were hopeful I'd be able to make a little money, but. Yeah, it wasn't like I, you know, I could I could choose cases I didn't get paid in. I I got paid. I, I've been paid by a bull being raffled. I've been paid by tamale auctions. I've been paid by all. I've, I've been paid in shrimp. Uh, so I mean, you know, uh, being you know, uh, mine probably hasn't been the most profitable legal practice of any out there. But I think it's among the most rewarding because, frankly, I love what I've done. And I love the uh, the practice that I learned to grow into. It's just nobody trained me how to take care of myself in the middle of all of this, and that was the hard thing to learn. 
if you don't mind, I'm going to, uh, at what I should have done this before, let Barb Bernowski, who, who really was the one that said, hey, look, this is something that our, our members want to hear that, that really does have a, an intrinsic value beyond just a lawyer talking about great things here done and, and, and being so open and honest. So I'm going to let, let Barbara go ahead and, and ask a few questions as, as we wrap up in the next eight to 10 minutes. If she's ready. Yes, well, I knew you guys, you'd be ready, Barb. You guys have uh, taken my breath away by covering the themes of the book. I, I wanted to make a comment about how you've written the book and then get your reaction to it. If we take out the beautiful art and we take out the poems that grow in the book from rather simplistic rhyming poems to very theoretical and dreamlike poems that just expand, we see your growth as a person and the narrative of the book. It could be read probably in a, an hour or two, just the narrative, your, your words, uh, aside from the studying the poetry, reading the poetry. And so have you reread the book to look at your narrative to show your incredible growth through the process? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. The answer is no, I have not. Um, what, what I would tell you is that the, the, I wrote this very quickly. Uh, I had written 365 days of uh, poems and narrative around a, a different painting of Isabel's every day. And that was what we called the virus vigil. And that was about kind of staying connected and being connected uh, with others. And then I, everyone was encouraging me. There was about 700 people on that email string and they were encouraging me to write a book about it or to put it into a book. Well, I couldn't put it all into a single book because it would have been over a thousand pages. And there was a narrative that was written every day. So I just decided to just try to sit down and, and make a book out of it. And uh, I mean, probably the most amazing thing was how it almost wrote itself. And you know, it, it, this, this seemed to be very organic. Uh, we put it together, I guess it probably took about two months of writing, uh, you know, and that was really constructing the narrative around the selected poems. But it really came together very quickly. And I have not, and it's interesting that you say that, that was not necessarily intentional that it was structured that way, uh, but there was in there, there was certainly a, a flow I was trying to to uh, to maintain, but certainly some of the aspects like the the politics of Earth's Church, uh, that chapter, I mean, that grew out of what happened during the virus vigil. That happened. That was 2020, 2021 in retrospect. And I mean, there's a lot of that I've written. Um, there's a poem uh, for Gandhi about hatred and about how devastating hatred is and how in how you act in the face of hate. And, um, you know, that's kind of where, you know, those are our times. So I think part of it is uh, a growth and a progression, but I did not intend that. It's just interesting you say it. It's, it's interesting you chose to self-publish. You've been published by some of the finest presses in the world. And yet this one is, such, is so personal. And let me just say thank you on behalf of the bookstore and other places that, that we have access to it. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just make very clear that the signed copies of your book are at Brazos. And I've always disclosed that I'm one of many community owners, but that what an honor to uh, have your book there as well as at uh, those principal places in, in uh, Houston, as well as at, at Amazon. But it's, it, it just strikes me that as I read the book, and I will tell you personally, in terms of seeing growth and recognizing our own foibles, it was very meaningful to me, extremely meaningful. And your growth just jumps out there as you mature, even though the book as a narrative starts with you on a Nile River boat exposed to COVID. And then it, yeah. it just uh, descends from there, but in a most interesting way, where you're in rehab with the fellow who's worshiping the Houston Metro, Metro bus. bus, yes, and it it Mike has brought you through it so so beautifully. Um, it it really is. I can't tell you what a positive impact it had on me, and I I think that the the notion of caring for self 
and our duties as lawyers to care for ourselves. And I noticed that Terry O'Rourke put TLAP there at the, uh, the, the link to the Texas Lawyers Assistance Project. And as you and I have discussed, the care for self and the recognition in ourselves and others of our foibles and our needs for self-care is the basic tenet of professional responsibility in Texas and really the, the standard of the country. And so any reflections you have on that and comments would be mostly appreciated, especially how you opened up the book with a riverboat on the Nile. I thought it was gonna end up with some murder uh, on the Nile, but was happy to see that it all ended happily. Well, I mean, the, the, again, it goes back to this virus vigil that we started and um, my wife and myself and uh, my artist co-author uh, and her husband, John Chapman, the four of us were on a Nile River boat, literally, when all of this came down about COVID and we got back into the country about five days before the borders were shut and uh, all the international flights were cut off. And so, you know, on the one hand, there was this kiss the ground moment when you get back in the United States and realize that, you know, I could have gotten caught in a really bad situation there. And then going into the virus vigil, what it became was sharing to connect with others. Um, you know, I, I found connection with nature personally, but I, what I realized very quickly is we were all very isolated during COVID. And so I used the 365 days of, uh, of emails, if you will, as a way of staying connected with friends, with people I've known, the people I've worked with. And it was just my way of every morning and it was sometimes a very poor poem or sometimes a painting of a bird they had no interest in, but it was just a way of reaching out and saying, we're here. How are you doing? Are you okay? And we don't do enough of that with each other. Um, you know, I mean, I think about, you know, something that, that strikes me, I'm at an age where the people that I know that I've grown up with are beginning to pass away. And everybody has such wonderful things to say about people that are no longer with us. You know, why don't we say them when people are alive so they could know what these people meant to us. And, and we often just never do that. And that to me is part of humility, it's part of connectivity, it's part of love. And I mean, it sounds a little silly to talk about it in that way, but there is just, I think, a way that we get along with each other that could be improved a lot. And I think along the way, we'd be better off. Well, Jim, thank you so much for, for sharing what you've shared. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing. I hope you'll at least consider being with us in June at the Hotel Zaza. That's not too far walking distance from where you're at already uh, and, and, and have an opportunity to, to meet with our members. Thank you for what you have, have basically spoken to, which as Barb pointed out is we go through a lot of struggles in life. You know, our job as lawyers is really to fight in so many respects, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be one of my heroes for a long time. Al Smith was the happy warrior. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of something that I, I try and think about a lot. And I think what you've pointed out is how important that is, not just to you as an individual, but but our system. And thank you for being here. And thank you for a really interesting ethical CLE. You've really shared with us things that are important. Thank you. You bet. Well, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, Thanks for, you know, Earth Church meeting CLAs turned out to be okay. Thank you. I think you. it turned out to be great. Thank you all. We'll see you yeah. hopefully potentially live next April. Certainly we're going to be live in June, barring some other craziness. But thank you again, and we'll see you all next month. Goodbye.